Gracias. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and I'm going to say it, the wonderful Bob Cook. Oh, I do like how you start that. (laughs) And in this episode, we're going to explore working with the challenging client. That is a great phrase. So I'm going to start by asking you a quick inquiry. And that is, what do you, as a psychotherapist, what do you define as challenging? When somebody says to you, oh, you know, I've got clients which are so challenging, XXX. Um, it's an interesting phrase. So what do you think of or how do you define the word challenging? Depends what day you ask me on, Bob, because it <laughs> probably changes. Um, sometimes I find working with couples challenging because, you know, being in the middle and being a moderator to a certain extent. Yeah, um, there's lots of different degrees of what challenging is and again you know I'm being completely honest here it depends what day you catch me on if if there's a client that is very demanding of my attention and I'm feeling tired then I would find that quite challenging on a certain day if I'm going through something in my personal life and the client is going through something similar in theirs I would find that client quite challenging they I, I couldn't put it in a a box okay so I, I will attempt was to... that the answer you wanted <laughs> no <laughs> yeah no it's a very very authentic answer and I think I understand where you're coming from and I've I will put it in a little bit more of a structure for you and why that I think about it um I don't really like the phrase it's the same I don't really like the phrase when people talk about um mistakes in psychotherapy but I certainly don't really like the phrase when people talk about difficult clients so so let's stay with challenging because that's the remit of this podcast now I think for falls into a structure so when therapists say that it falls into two roads one where they haven't been trained Mm -hmm. and they haven't got the information or they haven't got the here's how to work with particular clients so an interesting one, and all the counsellors on listening to podcasts might scream at me, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I've a f- uh, counselling courses can run from six months to six weeks to three years to four years, and you get very good counselling courses. But one of the big drawbacks, I think, in counselling courses per se, is they don't uh, they don't deal with how to work with psychotic clients or disturbed clients, and psychotherapists tend to. So you see, I think that if if people come with strong personality disorders to counsellors, they would find that very challenging, mainly because they haven't been trained to deal with that type of person. Yeah. So when people say, oh, I've, this person's very challenging, it may well be because they haven't been trained to, to know how to work with that client. Yeah. And they have to go off and have some CPD training or some extra specialist training to have that information to work with clients. So I'm doing some training with some Slovenian therapists actually. Um, Next week I think in, is on how to work with um, specific personality disorders. Now, many people perhaps don't have the information. So if somebody comes with a personality disorder, they, may, they would find that very challenging if they haven't got the training to know how to work with that person. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Yes, yeah, totally. <laughs> Which is why it's really important that, you know, we do do continuous professional development and go to supervision and all those sorts of things, definitely. That's one subset. And the second one is, is what you hit on, really. I think a lot of people term clients as difficult or challenging when the material that the client brings hits on the unresolved material of the therapist. Yeah. Which is what you sort of 
hundred percent, definitely. Oh, when you said, if you were dealing with certain personal issues in your own life, and that person came with the same personal issues, so you had a, a lot of identification, which yeah. meant that you might term that person quite challenging because it's actually was challenging for yourself. Yes. Yeah, which, you know, the the, um, the longer I am a psychotherapist, the more sometimes I think the universe throws me certain clients yeah. in order that I reflect on myself. Yeah, so perhaps they should actually pay you. Yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes <laughs> I do think that, Bob. <laughs> you know, but I understand you know, if we move away from that humour of that. And, and really, in the business, they call what we're talking about counter transference mm -hmm. yeah and that's the client that comes along and they're actually you know um you, as you talk to them you ident there's a personal identification so so for example if you have some parts of you which are depressed that hasn't been resolved because of certain traumas in your own history and you haven't worked on that in therapy or you haven't dealt with those issues and a client comes along that is depressed yeah then yeah. it might be quite challenging to work with that particular client because they may you know um, actually um, hit parts of yourself which is very similar to them and therefore you then both run the risk of ending up submerged in a codependent relationship instead of dealing with the feelings of the depression. Yeah. And that's called in the business counter transference. It uh, might be called a, a, a projective identification, which is a type of counter transference where we identify with the uh, content that the person's bought, which then hits on our unresolved processes in ourselves. Yeah. And then we will call that type of client, or we might call that type of client, challenging. Yeah. And there's there's no way of foreseeing that necessarily with clients uh, in the early days. Yes, no. Yes and no, I think. Yes, in the sense that we, you know, we can't always legislate for things that might actually hit on our own personal stuff mm. but we can in some ways have good guesses so in other words um if you have had a particularly traumatic history and you haven't dealt with things which perhaps are to do with abandonment neglect or trauma or whatever we're talking about then i was thinking of people that work you know i was thinking in your area of expertise really i was thinking of people being fostered people have been adopted or people have had traumatic histories to do with abandonment neglect or oh. uh, we sort of know that if we if we have had that in our own history then there's a good chance that what they're talking about might actually you know i we might actually identify with that yeah. so instead of taking people to where we need to go to which is to their feelings we we may intellectually talk about it instead yeah. So we might have good guesses that we don't work with certain people because that might happen unless we've done the therapy and resolved it inside ourselves first. Yeah. You are right, by the way. I also agree with you that you can work with many clients and then suddenly as you go down the layers, things that pop up and XX. And sometimes with certain clients' histories, I think it's important to think twice as a clinician. If you haven't resolved those issues yourself, um, do you work with them? And then the other side of it, of course, is you might think you've dealt with them and then actually you find out you haven't. Yeah. I'm thinking of, of life events, really. Do you know what I mean? That, that can make it quite challenging for us to see people. Like if we you know are going through a separation that is kind of like in in the present it can affect us with with certain clients if they're coming after going through a separation or if there's been a death in the family or 
you know, a, a life event in the here and now. I get what you're saying about the past and unresolved issues, 100 percent. But it can be that you've been working with a client for quite a while and then suddenly a life event happens that kind of puts you in a, a different place. Oh, well, if you've got a life event that was happening, I, I, I think it, I'm just thinking of what you might be talking about. So I don't know, your partner dies. Yeah. Or, or I don't know, you've uh, been made redundant at work or... Yeah. These are the these are the issues you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Then then it's up to you as a therapist, I think, whether you take time off work. Which so. then opens up a, a whole maybe different podcast that we can do at some point in the future. You know, as a therapist, what do we do if a life event happens and we need to take time out? Well, it is another pack podcast, but all therapists should have in uh you know have people they can refer to mm. or people who can take therapists so you know uh you know that's for i think the professional therapists to have organized really so they have got people they can refer to but that is another podcast it's a very yes. good it, yeah, podcast. yeah 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 uh, um so you know i was just thinking of a friend of mine whose father died recently and they took um took three months off i was thinking of another well-known therapist his 21 year old son died in a motor car motor car accident and he took a year off mm. so i think those are the duty of care issues that therapists need to attend to on on other sort of perhaps i don't know milder issues that you're talking about things like you know if you you know i don't know i can't somebody you've got a client who's been made redundant and you were just made redundant or something of those sorts of things yeah you have to make judgments i think which is like okay can the supervision i'm in therapy have i got enough support to deal with these things so i can move away from identification with the client yeah and come from an adult to adult perspective yeah which is kind of you know um, what we've been talking about now the the other side of a challenging client could be one that is attempting to push the boundaries a lot of the time, which, you know, I think that sometimes comes into the therapy session as well, where they try to extend the sessions or manipulation and yes. things. Yes, but yes, and if you've had adequate training, mm and you have the information how to deal with these profiles and you have supervision, then you, in most cases, are able to, to, to deal with the types of clients you're talking about, which are clients that are enacting out their past onto the present. Now, there are certain clients who are pretty, uh, might be particularly disturbed or have a, uh, a, a fragile adult that will act out in a way which you find personally hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. What you have to do is take it to supervision. And if it's still, if there's still not enough resources there, have a second supervision in the week. And if it still doesn't work, you'll, you'll have to go into therapy. And if you're still, you're still merged in sort of a mesh transference, then you need to defer on. Mm. Yeah. And the reason why I brought that up, I was watching a television programme called New Amsterdam. I'm not sure if you've watched it, but I quite like it. There's, there's a, a psychotherapist that works in a hospital and he had a client who was getting overly attached and um, he stopped seeing this client, but then this client kind of made contact through his family members and, you know, it, it got a bit dark in places but it, it's it's that's keeping your boundaries if you know you feel that the client isn't sticking to the boundaries you know for you to end the sessions but there's also that other side of it that is that ethical to stop seeing a client it it, it got me thinking watching this program they're, they're all different ethical dilemmas and yeah as well maybe for the podcast but you see i don't necessarily define those as challenging clients okay 
that's what I'm trying to say right at the beginning of this podcast, what you call challenging. Yeah. Now, the talk, I, I think the types of planets that you're talking about, we could put into particular, if we wanted to, and we've talked about many podcasts, narcissistic or borderline or, or any way we've talked about this before in podcasts, now you would expect that type of behaviour from those types of clients. Yes, yeah. Therefore, you would be trained on to know how to do with that next so the 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 dramatization if it's true or not new amsterdam i don't know what type of program it is but what you're probably talking about is a borderline client because that's the drama of these types of programs um which then probably follows the uh therapist and you have these darker things that you're talking about however in the first place any decent professional psychotherapist would have been having supervision to do to to talk about what to do next yeah yeah and like you you were saying it depends what we're defining as a challenging client yeah yeah, yeah. So there's a wonderful program by the way. wonderful a wonderful uh dvd it became a cult dvd called what about bob now, I quite like the title, not narcissistic, <laughs> but I quite like it. Uh, and it had the person, Bill Murray, who was in Groundhog Day. Yes. And it had Richard Dreyfus, who's very well known as well. And Richard Dreyfus was playing the American psychiatrist. Now, in the UK, we could say psychotherapist. And Richard, and that's Richard Dreyfus. And Bill Murray was playing this paranoid schizophrenic client. And you know, uh, basically, I don't want to distort, you know, take away the anticipation of the ending of all this lot, but the narcissistic uh, psychiatrist took on this client, which many of these ether therapists were terming as a, ch a challenging client, if you like. And he was so narcissistic, he took this challenging client on, which is Bill Murray, and then he decided to go on holiday. And in America, of course, you go for a month's holiday, you go on vacation. And of course, what happens then is this uh, paranoid uh, schizophrenic client or borderline client, however we want to define it, uh, uh, then gets a, a complete flashback to his own trauma and uh, can't hold the boundaries and follows Bill, uh, follows Richard Dreyfus to his, um, psych, his home and you've got all the dark things you're talking about here. But of course, in reality, the professional psychotherapist is trained to be able to work in a sensitive manner with these types of profiles. Now, if they are trained to be able to do that, they shouldn't be doing the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say back to that, except that I know what you're saying in the terms of people who, who clients who are very push you with boundaries and entitlement and all those things. And I know the therapist has to learn how to handle all these clients, but a very good training and some and a therapist that uses supervision can deal with most of these so-called challenging clients. Yeah. Because in the end, what is happening is they are enacting out their past into the present. And hopefully the supervisor, sorry, the therapist takes these um people to supervision so i'm going back to the you've got two categories i think one is when you haven't had the information or the training to deal with these clients and then you need to i think refer or not take them on yeah and then you get the, the 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 clients who um hit your buttons and talked about earlier on and you've got counter transference and the similar experiences haven't been resolved in the therapist and then it becomes quite difficult and the two client and the therapist get merged together how that can solve itself is through supervision and therapy by a the therapist. If that doesn't work, then the therapist needs to, I think, refer on. Yeah. So taking on board everything that you've just said, then I think it's really important for the therapist to, you know, to reflect on the sessions and to be self-aware of what's going on, which links into the, the supervision and things. Absolutely. And I know I, I was just listening to myself and perhaps I'm being a bit too concrete here and, uh, and there's blurred edges. I do realise that, especially if you're starting to build up your clinical practice and you're not that experienced and yeah. 
XXX. So perhaps I'm being a bit con concrete and these things will happen. Uh, I really do want to emphasize supervision though. Mm. And your own therapy. Yeah. And I, I was a therapist that always stayed in therapy or had access to therapy. So I was one that just did 160 hours of therapy uh, and then just stopped. So I always had access to therapy and I always um, used therapy a lot for all many of the things that you're just talking about where clients who are talking about probably the most fragile or traumatic issues and may actually hit on some of my own stuff. So I really do plead or take a plea for encouraging therapists to have therapy, to have access to therapists and to use supervision very wisely. Yeah. Because in the end, are there such, th are there such things as challenging clients? That is a very interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Given what we're talking about here, yeah. maybe there's such things as challenging therapists. Which is kind of my opening statement when I said to you, it depends what day you ask me the question. <laughs> Or well, going back to that very common sense answer of yours, um, you know, the, the, the many therapists are often very challenged because they they have clients who actually um, are actually hitting their own buttons and then yeah. they transfer the word challenging onto the client. Yeah. When in fact, perhaps their own history is very similar to the clients that have come through the room. So who is the most challenged, the therapist or the client? So we're back to what you said right at the beginning. And I said in a very sort of humorous way, well, perhaps the, uh, the person who should be paid is uh, the client rather than you. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, this, this podcast and other episodes as a whole, you know, it, it, for, for me, it, it encourages me to just be more curious and to have self-reflection, you know, after after seeing a client and to to look at how how it went from my point of view as well obviously i'm the in the session for the client but when i come out does anything stay with me outside of that room of the clients because to me that's a bit of an indicator that there's something yeah, yeah. So going we, on that's right so if we want to have indicators here on um, something going on for the therapist that's been stirred up by the content of the client, I'll give you some indicators. Number one, that, that you start thinking about the client outside the sessions in an obsessive way. Secondly, the client appears in your dreams. Now that sounds scary. <laughs> oh, I have many clients who, by the, by the way, have appeared in my dreams. And that I've taken to my therapist or my supervisor, both usually. That's two things. So somebody, yeah. A third one will be when you find yourself uh, meandering, thinking about your clients and unable to concentrate in your work. Fourthly, when the clients start to come into your professional life, and instead of focusing on the client in front of yourself, in front of you, you start thinking about this client. I suppose that's obsession, if you like. But all these indicators are uh, that the content of the client has, you know, an earth, unresolved psychological content of yourself. Yeah. And that's when you need to go to supervision or therapy. Yeah. And, you know, as, as a caveat to that, I, you know, I, I want to just say that it's, I don't know, it's not like, it's just a job and you do the job in that hour and you don't really give two hoots about your clients outside the therapy room. I didn't want to give that impression if that was the one that I gave, but you know, there's a time and a place for the client to be in your head and that's in that therapeutic space. When I walk out yeah. of my therapy room, you are I'm back to being Jackie <laughs> as opposed to Jackie the therapist, yeah. Absolutely, completely, because otherwise, uh, you couldn't. You would not be able to do your job, and your life, your life would be very difficult. Yeah. So absolutely, on another level, completely. I stopped working clinically after thirty-eight years, and I was thinking the other day, and I've actioned it in a little bit, is that I would like to write a, a sort of a book, which would be 
um, were quite existential about clients and about what what we can learn from clients, maybe in a metaphor or symbolic way. And I started to reflect and think about lots of clients. And actually, I could think about many, many clients. Um, and that, that was quite nice because it, it meant that I was, I, th th those clients had stayed with me, and yeah. quite nurturing and soothing. And I could think, oh, yeah, I was thinking about how they got on and quite a lot of professional satisfaction in my successes. And I think in my older years and my retirement, that's very nice. Yes, yeah, yeah. So and that's another level altogether. 100%, and I, I, I get that in a, a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling in my stomach. And I think I feel the same way with fostering to a certain extent. I've got yes. a, a bit of those kids in me and I carry that forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in an appropriate way. Yeah, in an appropriate way. So getting back to the title of this podcast, I don't know if we have challenging clients and I don't know if we have challenging therapists. I suspect they sort of go together. I think that is a lovely place to end. It's an exploration. That's what we're doing. We're pulling back the curtain on the therapy room. And I think we've done that, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very, so much. Yeah, in a very relational way. Yes. Yeah. 100%. So what we're going to be looking at next time is the importance of boundaries, which kind of follows on quite nicely from this session. Yeah, we've got two. Yeah. Well, yes, it follows on very well because we've been talking about boundaries a moment ago yeah so um, we're going to do um the next one on the importance of boundaries and the one after that um about the use of the self and self-disclosure in the therapeutic process well you know i'm looking forward to both those podcasts already me too me too literally i can't wait <laughs> i will see you in the next podcast bob yeah we will okay thank you take care you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode